We sort of moved into it a little bit, chapter 13, last class, but I want to start with verse 1 and 2 again, or verse, yeah. And, um, but mainly we're going to be talking uh, verses 3 on down, Lord willing, depending on how far we get. <clears throat> All right, Genesis 13, verse 1, beginning with verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Okay, so uh, what is the most significant part of that verse? Anybody? What? He went out of Egypt. Okay, anyone else? Lot went with him. Very significant. What else? He was rich. That's significant. What else? I guess that's it, huh? <coughs> um, actually, the most significant part of that verse is, um, and all that he had. Because we would say this was a successful trip. God moved, God protected, God was real, God was there, God was everything down in Egypt. And we would say um, that God protected them and brought him out even more rich than before. But there's a problem here, and that is this little, ver this little part of this verse, and all that he had, which meant Hagar, the Egyptian came out. This is where he picked up Hagar. Okay, so we know that <clears throat> he brought the thing out of Egypt that would cause problems for the, all generations of God's people, Israel, all the way up to this day. Because she would have Ishmael. And Ishmael would be tied with the, the Arabs and the fighting between them and the Jews. All right, so can we just say it? We need to be careful what we're, what we're thinking and seeing. I mean, a very um, innocuous, as it were, verse, the, the, the most significant thing is something that it doesn't just say it and jump out at you and say, this is what's happening, and oh no, and this is going to be trouble from now on, and you know, this is really going to be a major part of the story of Abraham's life too, huge, huge, huge part of his life uh, that will cause division and problems and all this kind of stuff. It just says, and all that he had. Okay, so... How are we going to know? I mean, number one, we need to know the Bible, but number two, we need to be open to the Holy Spirit. We need to be open to him to say, uh, wait a minute, there's a part of this that seems the least, and yet it's the greatest, not in greatness, but in significance. And we need to, and, and, and you should be praying right now, Lord, help me to be this way. Lord, help me to have a heart open to your spirit and uh, to your desires and to the way that you see your orientation to things and, and help me to not just read a book like I'd read any other book. You know, uh, the example I use is we read Abraham the way we'd read a book on Abraham Lincoln. You know, just reading and just looking at whatever it's saying and, you know, most books like The Life of Abraham Lincoln probably would really make the significant thing stand out and say a bunch of stuff around that and go, yeah, you know, because you're too dumb to get this, you know, <laughs> or something like that, you know. And, but but <clears throat> God's Word doesn't do that. God uh, is a God that hides himself, and he wants our heart to go after him. He wants our heart to... to be more in tune with him than with us. And even though this is um, not like other points that I've made where we sort of missed it before, uh, this is, uh, uh, it's not a 
good point, <clears throat> it is a God point. Bringing Hagar out isn't a good point, but it's a God point. And, <clears throat> as I said, it's going to be a significant thing from, from here on and in huge ways. Okay. So, so what do we also gain from this? Ah, God is moving the pieces on the chessboard. He's moving things in place. Everything's coming together. He is bringing it toward <clears throat> finding, finding his firstborn son. Praise God. And, and okay, so great story. Can God be doing that in your life? I mean, if you were the neighbor of Joseph and Mary and you also had been born in, you know, let's say Jericho, and then a decree by Caesar who rules the whole world says everybody's going to have to go to the place of your birth and there's going to be a census taken. And you would say to Joseph and Mary, this is horrible the expenses, the, the pressure on my family to move, all the things that are going to go into this. This is terrible, you know. And Joseph and Mary might be going, yeah, this is rough. And she's pregnant. She's going, well, you think you got problems. I'm pregnant. But the prophets of old, long before, had said, out of Bethlehem would come a Savior. And so that was their home, and that's why they went there. What does that say again? God is busy moving the chess pieces, getting everything lined up for what? To reveal his firstborn son. He's always doing that. Whether in us, or in history, or in the prophets, to declare that. <clears throat> um, and, and frankly, we need to have more of a sense of being part of God, you know, we say, well, I'm a part of God's plan. I got saved, da, 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 da. Ah, no, no, no. How about a part of God's view and way of working? And, you know, I mean, if we're not really pursuing the firstborn son, we're just trying to be good Christians, then I guess you can just pretty much just pick any choice you want or just find God's will for your, you know, what car you should buy. You know, I mean, that's, you know. Or you can get in tune with him and say, I want your firstborn son, and then be actively involved in his heart plan and the Holy Spirit. What? What was the Holy Spirit sent for? Oh, to make people dance and make people, you know, shout and do all that. I, I have no problem with that, but that's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Jesus identified it and said, he will testify of me. He will not speak of himself. He will glorify me. And he goes through all of that. Jesus uh, in that chapter, John chapter 14, 15, and 16. So I'm trying to tell you things that um, really are eternally significant. Um, this move right here is eternally significant. While it is not, okay, so let's, t let's take that. That scripture, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are thee called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknow he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his, not, not his savior, not his redeemer, not his healer, not his son. Okay. But it says all things work together for good. It does not say all things are good. This thing in itself is not good. But this thing right here is, because it's in God's plan, is working toward revealing his firstborn son. That's, the, that's where it's going to end up. And then when it's all over, we're going to know who the firstborn son is in this story. <clears throat> okay, so it's, you know, Again, it is, um, uh, it's not, I mean, we say, okay, well, I, you know, I lost my phone. Well, that's not good. We didn't say, again, he didn't say all things are good. He said all things work together for the good to form Christ in you. 
Okay, so that means that bringing in Hagar in the picture seems horrible, and yet God is going to work that. It doesn't justify Abraham. But there's something higher than Abraham's mistakes. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, I mean, that, you know, yeah, that's like, you know, we fall on our knees and go, yes, thank you, Lord. Because, because there, that's the fact. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. That's, you know, one of the things you find in this place, and maybe, Chris, you'll find it in this place more, too, that we don't, we don't center on people's mistakes or problems or things. We center on Christ. And we do that because it, if that thing if that thing was huge in itself, let it be huge for revealing the sun in us. Let it be one of the things in itself not good, but working toward that good, which is that we may be conformed to the image of his son. So these are, these are not doctrines I'm talking about. They're not nice little things to, to learn and tuck away in your theological hard drive to call up when the subject comes up. These are things to tuck away in your heart and, and say, hey, Lord, that means, that means all things can work towards this end, and I'm going to make sure that my desire is with you to, to receive your son, to receive your firstborn son. You get on that track? you're going to be conformed. You know, it says to uh, those who are called are he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So we go, well, if I'm, if I'm predestined, then I will. And if I'm not, I won't. But years ago, and when I was in Bible school, I was going, I don't get this predestination thing. I don't get it. It messes with me and everything. And the Holy Spirit has to deal with me in pictures and like, a real dumb person because I don't get it, you know. So he, he said, okay, it's like this. There's a, you're at a train station and, um, and this train pulls up and on it it says, to be conformed to the image of his son. And so you get on that and this is predestined to come to that stop eventually up there, okay. But if while you're riding it, you go, hey, that looks cool. And it's like, ding, and you get off here and you step off the train, and you hop on another train, you are not predestined to go be conformed to the image of his son. Now you are predestined to go wherever that thing takes you. Does that make sense? We think predestination is totally fixed for everything and everybody, whether you're predestinated or predestined or not. And it is, if we, are, if we want his son, all things work together. If not, you have a train wreck, you're just dead. <laughs> Sorry to be blunt, but that's the way I see it, you know. You just died. The other way, yeah, there might be a death, but you, there's going to be a resurrection in Christ. And he will be the resurrection, by the way. And the life. <laughs> he said that. Y'all remember that? <clears throat> Amen. Jeez, I didn't know I was going to spend this much time on this first little part. Okay, so let's go to, let's read the beginning of verse 3 and go all the way through 13 with the hopes that by reading this, it will force me to share only and up to verse 13. All right, verse 3. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar which he, he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. We discussed that, I think, last class, verse 5. And Lot also went with Abram, uh, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. So this guy came out of Egypt smelling pretty good too, you know? I mean, he got stuff. Isn't it fun to get stuff? <laughs> no, not if Hagar's part of it. <laughs> Just a reminder, <laughs> uh, verse 6, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together and there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and herdsmen of Lot's cattle. 
And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And I think that's where I sort of stopped maybe last time. I don't know. And Abraham said unto Lot, no, I think I went on here. Uh, let, <clears throat> let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be brethren. We be brethren. I like that. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Okay, so, so I'm going to still read 10 through 13, but let's just think about this. This is Abram. God promised him the land, and he says, if you go to the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If you go to the right hand, I'll go to the left. You know, either you're dealing with one or two things there. Either you're dealing with somebody who has no connection with God at all, and he's just bouncing around wherever it leads. Or you got somebody that even though the whole land was given to him is secure not in the land or in his possessions or in if somebody tries to take it away. He's secure in the Lord. He's secure. I mean, have you ever gone, well, they're taking away my ministry or, you know, they're taking away part of my, or they're whatever. I don't even want to talk like that. <laughs> I don't. I don't even, you know. Even, even to explain things. It just has a bad taste in my mouth. Um, uh, verse 10. Uh, for some reason, I have the word she in front of the number 10. Anyway. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. Okay, so, the, it, so he's going to the place that's even as the garden of the Lord, He's trying to get back to the garden instead of God. Now, I was a hippie in the 60s, and we had songs that talked about getting back to the garden because it sounded so cool. And we would walk around barefooted and be ourselves, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, so I guess Lot's the father of the hippies. Not really, and that's, you know, uh, Deb's going, uh, no. Um, uh, but there is this thing. We, as hippies, we're trying to get back to the garden instead of to God who is there with us. Amen? You see that? That's a big deal. And Lot is doing the exact same thing. He just wants, he's thinking of it in terms of the garden of God. The garden of God. What about God? Well, yeah, but, you know, the garden. I mean, a mist, you know, watered it and... You know, just, anyway. Uh, so, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor, then Lot chose him, cho then Lot chose him. See, he's choosing him. He's choosing himself. This is what I choose because this is me. This is what we do, folks. You can't run from that. You can only be changed into his image. You know. But before that happens, there needs to be a death. Put that away. You say, well, I'm trying to. I say, well, Jesus already did that. I am crucified with Christ. Not, not I'm going to crucify. You don't crucify yourself. You can't. It's impossible. If you were nailed up there... You know, you nail your feet, you nail your hand, you go, whoops. You know, you cannot crucify yourself. Okay, it takes some help. And God will help you. <laughs> He's such a blessing. <laughs> all right. Um, verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And that's significant, isn't it? They separated themselves one from the other. And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. All right. So, you know, Lot gets there, and he goes, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I mean, it was nice. It's the best place around. I picked the best. So did they. 
but what does God's people choose? What's his will? And that may be our orientation is shifted from, you know, like the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, you know, uh, who shall be the greatest among us? Who shall be the greatest? He said, he that is servant of all. And they go, yeah, yeah, we, we will serve. You know, we'll, we'll make sure we serve, but we just want to know, well, can we be the greatest? See, there's that greatest thing, that thing that we're clawing after, that we want, that we desire, that pushes itself forward even to Jesus. It'll push itself all the way to Jesus until you're pushing Jesus. Excuse me on the recording. I'm pushing the, the pedestal here that I'm not on. Uh, <laughs> I refuse to get on it. Okay, so, um, so in Romans, it says that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. Let me just read to you Romans 5 through 9. If you want to jot down the reference, you can do that. If you want to turn, you can do that. Romans 8, verses 5 through 9. For they that are after the flesh, okay, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, okay? So if you're after the flesh, your mind is going in that direction, okay? And when it says flesh, it's, it's just talking about those desires of, of, of the old nature and of our carnal perceptions, which is the carnal mind. They that, after the, uh, uh, they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, okay? Now, this isn't the death of being with Christ on the cross. This is the death of being like the, the, the thief on one side that's cursing Jesus and saying, if you're the son of God, get us down from here. And Jesus is going, I'm the son of God, I'm staying. <laughs> right? Well, he didn't say that in the scripture, but I'm just telling you that. That's <laughs> um, because the carnal mind is uh, enmity against God, meaning it's an enemy. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you now. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So he's not just talking about the Holy Spirit. I mean, it takes the Holy Spirit to know him. That's always built into the, to the word spirit, wherever. But this is making it absolutely clear that it's the spirit of Christ that we need to have or we're an enemy with God. You know? I mean, that would be like, if I can draw these three circles here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if the Son, if the Son wasn't there, or if something else replaced the Son, if the Son wasn't in this Trinity, I'll put a ring around all three circles, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If the Son wasn't in here, it would not be God. And it would not be of God. Not that they wouldn't be, but that wouldn't be. If, we, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, I'm not saying you're God, you're not, Jesus is, but that's the spirit of Christ that's supposed to be in you. Amen? You take that out of the equation and you're messing with the Trinity. All right, so, so then you remember how I've tried to teach you how to get on the road of the Father's heart and just be with him and the Holy Spirit, just say, hey, show me, because that's why he came and all that. And, well, here's how to get on his wrong side. Start putting you in place of the Son. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What do you mean I'm none of his? I got saved, I give, I go to church, I've, I, you know, <clears throat> I've, I've done more than you all. Kind of like the elder son to me. But anyway, not to push that. Ye elder sons. <laughs> but, um, so, <clears throat> um, it's because of our carnal minds that we begin to suppose and put things and people over God's choice. 
we, you know what, we see that, we see that with, in the book of Esther, we see that with Mordecai. And every time he gets to the point of, of uh, making a decision, he goes against the king's commandment every time. Every time it's mentioned there. He goes against the king's commandment. It's like, well, you know, this is my mind, and I'm going to stand up against not knowing. He's literally standing up against the king's command. And, I, and, uh, and so the, the other people say, don't you know that you're contramanding the king's command? In other words, you're going against the king? And he's, no, no, I'm going against Haman. That's the carnal mind. That's shoving out the law of God. That's shoving out the Lamb of God. That's shoving out the Son, the Spirit of Christ. And it's saying, my mind knows what's best in this situation. And I choose to look like I'm spiritual, but violate the king on a regular basis. Anybody ever had trouble with your mind, you know, just saying, well, I'm going to... I'm going to go with, you know, and it's easy to do because we're so familiar with our mind. You know, I know what I think. And the reason why I think this way is because I'm so righteous and I'm so, so stable. I'm, I'm so centered. I'm not centered on Christ, but I'm so centered. My chi is centered, whatever. I'm, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> So, um, so you have the example also of, and I've used this a lot, but you know, of David when, when Samuel was sent by God, sent by God to anoint God's firstborn, Samuel, I guess, hadn't learned from Genesis and then the story of Exodus and, the, and all of that go, going through it, <clears throat> and he gets there. And he says, well, bring your sons in. And he brings in the elders and he goes, surely this is the Lord's anointed. This is the firstborn. This is him. I know it is because he's taller than everyone else. You know, or he's more handsome or he's, you know, got the best abs or da 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 da. I don't know. But, you know, going to... You know, all the things that, you know, women go to. <laughs> and so, you know, and God says, no, that's not him. Oh, we'll bring the next one in. Hmm, okay. Nah. <laughs> you know. I mean, I wonder, because, you know, how many sons were there? There's a bunch of them. So I think. Was it six or eight? I don't remember. Okay, so it doesn't matter what, what probably happened about halfway through the number was that, that Samuel went, I don't know. <laughs> he keeps telling me, no, that's not it, or shut up, or stop, or, you know, and I don't, I clearly don't know. So let's see if God goes, woo, this is it, you know. He goes through them all, and he goes, God didn't respond at all. This is looking back. Got any more sons? And he goes, yeah, just the youngest. The youngest? The least? The, the first and the second and the third? These guys are, are fit for battle. They're in Saul's army. Sounds horrible to me. Anyway, <laughs> David is just a shepherd with his father's sheep, that's how it describes him, his father's sheep. That, that'd make a great shepherd, wouldn't it? Great pastor, his father's sheep. But he's the least. See, I'm sure Samuel learned a little bit about orientation that day. Looking at the greatest, and you'd have probably chose Lot, you know, or because, uh, you know. So we learn to not discount the least. Do you hear me? We learn not to discount that. That doesn't mean you, you know, um, just swallow it hook, line, and sinker, but it means that you never discount it. You say, well, that, you know, just because this person looks da-da-da-da and so da-da-da, 
and this person does it right now, this could be the one that God wants to use. Am I pointing to you? Who am I pointing to? <laughs> but you see what I'm saying. I mean, it is, we need to get this incorporated into us. We don't need to have stories and go, amen, and go, wow, that was really good class or something. And because it's not a good class if it doesn't become life in us. And that's the point. That's our heart. That's our goal. Not my teaching. I'm just quoting the scripture for the most part. You know, people say, you're a good preacher. I say, I just quote scripture mainly. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to read, and, you know, again, you don't have to turn there. I just want to read it. I'm, I'm still dealing with being carnally minded is an enmity with God, and he calls it, it to be carnally minded is death, you know. God, man. Uh, I want to read Isaiah 55, 2 through 8, and you can mark, mark down those verses if you want to just listen. <clears throat> Isaiah 55, verses 2 through 8. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, see, hearken diligently unto me, incline your ear, and come unto me. Incline your ear, come unto me. Remember, this is Isaiah 55. What happened just two verses, two chapters in front of this? Isaiah 53, where the, there's the best Old Testament scripture that presents the Lamb of God as he really is that you'll find in the whole Old Testament, Isaiah 53. So he's still building on that reality. So when he says, come to me or hear me, he's talking about this, this one that God exalts because he was... He was selflessly given. <clears throat> he was a sacrifice. Here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Okay, so this is the sure mercies of David. The, the relationship with David that he had with God wasn't covenantal as it were it wasn't a covenant relationship as what it was with Moses it was a it was based on sure mercies that he could live that way I'm sure you know his his mercies are new every morning who said that David out of the Psalms his mercies are new every morning he didn't get up and go oh I hope I don't break the law today Hope I don't do something wrong. My whole life is to worry. That's my ministry. <laughs> God called me to worry for me and for you. I worry about this church. I worry about Randy. I worry. That man's really, really off. <clears throat> and Randy's walking around going, Hallelujah. And they're going, what is this? The sure mercies of David, the sure mercies that the Lord gives us in Christ. The, the son of David is what they called him, so that he would be seen as the son, not the father of David. We go, why isn't he the father of David? How is he David's son? Because he's the son David truly had. He's the son was real, more real than his other sons. Can anybody say amen that know that story, those stories? Oh, my God, this is the son. And this is David's, David's son that he's hanging on to, holding on to and finding showers of blessings, as it were. Uh Verse 4, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people. <laughs> this is your witness, the son, in this manner, <clears throat> a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One. See, we go, he's the Holy One. 
No, he's the only one. Because he's the holy one. You're the unholy one. <laughs> Amen? If you don't believe it, let me pray this prayer. Lord, show them they're not the holy one, but the unholy one. And then watch what happens to your life for the next month. <laughs> and when I, usually when I offer that, most people go, no, I've got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. <laughs> um, for he hath glorified thee. Verse 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. See that? <clears throat> That's what should be going on right now. Our spirits, our hearts right now. Not a class, not a, an event, not even an earth thing in our heart. I am seeking you, Lord. I, I'm here for you, Lord. I am I, I, my heart desires you, Lord. My wife and I were eating dinner tonight, and she went out of the room to do something, and I reached over and grabbed my iPad and started back in, you know. And uh, so she came in, she said, oh, would it, be dis is it, would it be disturbing if I, you know, sat here and, I said, uh, oh, while you prepare for class. I said, I'm not preparing for class. I said, I'm going after the Lord. I want the Lord in my heart. I was just like, yay, I've got two seconds. Because <laughs> you know? he can speak to you in two seconds. I know your schedule is really big, and most of ours really are. But, you know, it can be so busy. And you sit down at lunch and just throw open your Bible for a second, or you just say, Lord, you know, speak to me, or Lord, I want you, and that's, and somebody says, come, go, and you go, I'm, I don't get any time with the Lord. Make it quality time. Make it quality time. Not the, It's not the amount. I, I told Deb that from the very beginning. I said, look, our time, <laughs> we sort of had to do that. We met in Bible school. Uh, when we graduated, they said, we want to send you to, to Jamaica as missionaries right off the bat. So we got married, and we slept on the floor of the infirmary, didn't we? That slept on the floor. Of, this is our wedding night. And I said, I, I, I was always telling her, but we're, you know, this is us. This is what we're going to do. We're going to be together. And so we're, we're, we get to Jamaica, and it's like uh, um, you get up at, Five, you actually don't get up. You have to be moving at five. We have an orphanage. We have a school. I'm pastoring several churches. We get up, we go, you know, and the first thing you do is you're probably going to either be cooking for everybody or cleaning the dishes or doing whatever, and then it's off to the races for the whole day. Then at around midnight, you lay your tired body down on that thing, you know, and I'm going, Lord, I'm just not getting any time with you. And, I, and he just said, just, just take what you can right now. Just have some quality time. And I said, I love you. I want you. And he would sing his heart to me, as it were. Throughout the day, after a while, it started the momentum. It's like a snowball going down the hill. It starts gathering more snow, and it gets bigger, and it gets, and I can feel that mom momentum building in the midst of no time. And I'm going, you know, of course, part of it is I'm saying to the leader, well, how do you expect me to pastor three churches, go to the, <clears throat> the, the, the place where they throw the people away who are about to die and preach to them? and then go up on the highest hill in Jamaica and preach to the prison that is up there. How do you expect me to have anything from the Lord for them? Christian school all day, and then you know, I taught the Bible school there. So, and it's like, you know, I mean, I, I, I went, you know, basically three years to Bible school I gathered so much that the Lord began to reveal his son in me. It was like all the time I was always with the Lord da, 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 and had time to seek him at time, uh, many times and get here and I don't have any. So I went, well, thank God 
that I've got enough to last here because he shared so much with me. So I start sharing, and it's like gone in six weeks. Yeah. I'm going, ah, I thought this would last like three years. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but then he just fills that quality time with the Lord. I want to be with you. You see, it's, it's a heart thing. It's not, oh, God. I have these few moments before you speak your heart. You know, I, I'm not trying to make fun of so I'm just trying to say that, you know, we can be religious in this thing instead of just, Lord, I'm a mess. Help me, but I do love you. You know, just, just so you know that, if you kick me out, you're kicking out somebody who loves you. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you? <laughs> All right, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way uh, and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Okay, so this is, this is a fact. Well, you know, let me just read this. What time? I need to get some done stuff. All right, so, his, so he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And I wrote this. And while we agree with the verse that points out his ways and thoughts are not our ways and thoughts, yet we assume that the definition of that pertains to the ways and thoughts of a God who would be far superior to ours. That's what we say. We think that... He wrote that because, of course, they're not. You're God. You, you know, no wonder. And I'm just me. And I've only been on the earth for a short time, and I don't know anything. But that's not what he's talking about. Or let me just read how I put it. Little do we know that the contrast has more to do with his ways being smaller and weaker than ours. We choose strength. We choose the best. We want to look the best. We want to... We want everybody impressed with us. We want all of this, you know, we want power or we want, you know, prestige or we want, you know, uh, we're seeking somebody to affirm us or on and on and on and on and on. And he's looking at us going, your ways are not my ways. The very God himself came down, became as a man, as a man became a servant, as a servant became as a criminal to people and a reprobate concerning their religion. And then he became a dead man. Three and a half years of ministry. Poor guy. No. It was the greatest moment. I mean, I, I, have, I have many times looked <coughs> at Mary, the mother of Jesus, there, and John, who stayed with her, and all the other people that were weeping and going, oh, this is horrible, this is terrible, oh, gosh, this is, what a horrible turn that this thing has taken, uh, and, you know, I mean, they would just kill me. If I was standing there, I'd go, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen ever on the whole planet for all time more is accomplished in this than anything else this is glorifying God and they'd all jump on me and kill me <laughs> and yet there's millions maybe billions in churches that as long as you say well to save us but it's still it's still him looking like a criminal and taking it and all the blame and all the, you know, rejection and <clears throat> all the shame and all of that. And it is. Paul said, if I glory, I will glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it starts with glorying in the fact that he was willing to be that way for someone who... Uh, I wish I could read to you how I wrote it, maybe in the f 
few minutes that I got there uh, today. I wrote it today. <clears throat> I, I have parts of it, and I don't want to mess it up, so it'll, it'll come up later. All right. So, so just talking about the carnal mind. We don't, we don't realize, but I mean, if we're, if we're born again, then we automatically have a carnal mind. You know that, because our minds are not renewed. We're just saved, you know. Somebody says, well, the Lord, you know, what happened to you? Well, the Lord saved my soul. No, he, he, you were born again in spirit. Your soul is still messed up, <laughs> right? You were spiritually dead, and now you're spiritually alive. But your soul is still a mess. <laughs> we all need Jesus no matter how long you've been saved or whatever, <clears throat> or how much you know, because whatever you know does not, does not touch the, I'm gonna say it like this, the orientation of his mind, the way that he thinks. It doesn't touch that. It, it's too much theology and it's too much um, Bible truth that doesn't include him, you know. Well, I know exactly how many, how many sons that Jesse had, you know. <laughs> Randy's stupid. He doesn't remember. Well, I remember one. <laughs> I don't really remember the others, but I do remember one, and that was the firstborn that God called as his firstborn. That's a, and you know what? That's all I want to know. You know, I, I think my Bible knowledge and scripture quoting and all of that has, has really lessened from where I used to be. But I think my knowing of him might have grown and I'm get, I, I at least feel like I'm heading in the right direction, you know. You can have that. I don't want that, Lord. I just want you. <clears throat> all right, so we have Lot. Um, Abraham literally gives him a choice. Does God ever give us a choice? Yeah. Does he do it regularly? Yeah. Isn't it interesting that God, out of all the things that he gave us in the beginning, he gave us free will. Right? And in free will, if you, if you just cut it down to what most people call simple salvation, we have the choice to choose Jesus or to reject Jesus, right? God gave us the will to do that, you know. Um, as I've said before, uh, you know, somebody came and told me all this bad stuff people were saying, you know, that's on the internet about me and how bad a person I am and all this stuff. And I said, well, it's a free country and they have free will. God gave them free will. It's okay. And they're going, yeah, but don't you realize? Don't you know? You know? Don't you know what this could do to your reputation? I'm thinking, you know, I've really been trying to be, make myself of no reputation. See, Jesus didn't let them take his reputation. He made himself of no reputation. It was an act of sacrifice and a spirit of sacrifice to the Father that he did that. We all got the blessing of it. But the father got the glory of that son giving himself like that. So, you know, God gives us free will. He allows us to make choices. And so um, in, in this story, Abraham said, look, I tell you what, the whole land, the whole thing, pick what's in your heart. Pick what you're made of. Show us your orientation. So, you know, oh, they would, he wouldn't say all that because we go, oh, well, then I, I pick the lowest seat, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> we'd, we'd act spiritual, but it's not natural to us, see? And that's why the firstborn has to come out of us. 
because it is natural or nature to him. Okay? All right. So um, I wrote, God shows the pretender firstborn for what he is and what he produces. This is not, this is not what God wants. Okay? And then I wrote, wrong orientation. So God and Abraham give Lot the best, knowing that the lowest is what honors the Lord. He's like, he's like, Lot's going, I'll take the best. And Abraham's going, have at it, dude. It's all yours. You know. And you could say, God and Abraham chose the best, really. He chose God. Okay, that's true. But you're still, yeah, and you're still missing out on the best down here, you know. I mean, how many times have you chosen because of your religion to give up something that later on you went, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> you know, you know that looks they look like they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> and I'm the idiot being spiritual. <laughs> 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 or something, you know, there's so many examples of that. But, you know, geez, how much time do I have now? Still 10 minutes, it was 10 minutes. I started to say, was it 10 minutes while ago, too? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You have to watch people. I, I trust you, but I don't trust Kelly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I do the blog, I'm trying to do it within a 20-minute segment. You know, and Kelly goes like this, and she, she'll go, okay, uh, I forget the order that she does, okay. There's 15 minutes left. After five minutes, 15 minutes, okay. There's 10 minutes left, okay. Then I don't, if she likes what she's hearing, I don't see another sign after that. <laughs> you know, and, and she knows I'll just go, you know, and I'm, I'm going, you know, like, you know. Uh, but there's camera on me, and so I'm going, you know. And the Lord, you know, the Lord did it, and I'll go, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, God help us. God help her. <laughs> okay, so we went over part of this last time. Uh, I put a little subtopic on this called, If It's Yours, It's Yours. Uh, and Abram said in a lot, let there be no strife. And see, I'm sorry, but I just love this. He's Abram. Abraham, Abram is not just um, uh, being humble or even being with the Lord and taking the lower seat, as it were, or, or blessing, I'm just going to bless you or all that. All that could have some measure within it, but there's also this measure that we are brothers, and I don't want there to be strife between us, so I'll do whatever, you know, at my own loss. And people say, I love Randy. You can rip him off left and right, and he'll just, be, he'll be quiet. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, w I don't mind that reputation. If that was it, I don't, I don't know what my reputation is anymore. <laughs> Nor do I care. I just want Jesus. So, so if it's yours, it's, it's yours. And Abram said, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, for we are brethren. Um, and then I, I just have already covered this, but I'm going to read it. Remember, the land was given to Abram. Why would Lot be scrapping, scrapping, I don't know what word I meant there, over what is not his? Because due to circumstances, he has every reason to believe, as far as Abram, to believe that it's all his based on the Lord. But Lot has every reason to choose the best because that's so us, okay? So I put, but the order of man is not the order of God. Not only that, but the thing that qualifies one as the firstborn in the eyes of God 
Oh, what? We're getting to a major point that will be fulfilled in every story we cover in Genesis. This, this one right here. Not only that, but the thing that qualifies one as the firstborn in the eyes of God is related to conformity to the true and only firstborn. That son must be in us, formed and living. Okay. So, <clears throat> how does that happen? Well, it happened, you know, I mean, there's, we're seeking God, we're crying out, we're searching the scriptures, but not just trying to learn. Yes, we have to know the scriptures, but we want to know the living word in the scriptures. We know Jesus. Um, but in all of that, there is only one thing, one goal that the Father is aiming at. He's not saying, um, he may all along the way say, good, 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 good. But when the Son finally comes forth, he breaks up and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It's no longer about how well we're doing. It's about how well he is. In fact, it's about who is in us and not even what he does because Jesus said himself, I do all those all things to please my father. I do all, how's it go? I always do those things which please the father. So, um, Oh, no, no, no. This is, this is the time to stop. This is perfect. Because it's about to get real fun. As far as on this story. I mean, real, when I say real fun, okay. We're talking latter chapters of Abraham's life. But when we're talking about this area of the story right now, um, it's fixing to get real fun. All right, so we'll be uh, we'll still be in Genesis 13 and starting with verse 14. Let's see, I don't have another class following me tonight, do I? Okay, then I wanted to tell you about my trip to not really. <laughs> have you ever, anybody ever noticed that I do all these trips in all these different places and I never stand up in front of you and tell you what's going on? And if you ask me, what will I say? Some of you know. The Lord was good. <laughs> That's all? Was he good everywhere? <laughs> Pretty much. Because it's not about the trip, is it? It shouldn't be about it for them, but it definitely shouldn't be about it being a good trip. For me, it should be about the Lord. And that may mean that it wasn't a good trip. You know? I mean, that may mean everybody will rise up and throw tomatoes at me. But if that's the Lord, the Lord's going to be good. I'll, I'll say the Lord was good if he comes out of me and says, I bless you guys and love you. And, you know, if you really want to hurt me, right here is a good spot. Hit me right there. You know, <laughs> and do that in the spirit of Christ, then the Lord was good. You know, you know what I'm saying? When we're wanting our ministry and everything to go so wonderfully well, well, what are you going to do when it doesn't? God wasn't in this, you know. What happened to all things work together for good? Whatever happened to and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Whatever happened to, whatever happened to a grateful heart, you know. Father, we just, we just thank you <clears throat> that you have given us not just mercies and, and blessings and care and provision and direction. You've given us your son. And while our salvation was fully free and we didn't have to earn it, you said in Philippians what Paul said, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Father, 
while it doesn't cost us one thing for salvation, if we're going to know your son the way you want him to know, we have to be willing to throw things out of the boat, make it lighter so that we can row faster, so that we can be more precise in getting to you. So, Lord, thank you. Let your spirit do what he does best. Reveal Christ. Let your spirit prepare us uh, well in advance of revealing Christ. Let him prepare our ground so that the seeds of the word that go forth in these classes in church and, and in our private times with you will find rich soil that is so open and so ready to receive your seed, to want it in us. So thank you. Thank you, Father. Father, our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.